finished as an activist orchestra. It was founded in 2015, and its mission is to use classical music as a platform to engage audiences in dialogue surrounding social and racial justice. Past seasons have focused on themes such as police brutality, the school to prison pipeline, the Say Her Name movement, and most recently we've centered on immigration with our season entitled Sanctuary. It featured artists such as Vijay Iyer and Jennifer Coe, and also included guest speakers such as Ravi Ragbir, Fahad Ahmed, and other critical leaders in the worlds of immigration and social justice. The most important thing that I think sort of superseded all the other steps was just to build a team. Um, because this is not work that can be done by any one person. And so, you know, gathering people like, um, like Ashley and like James Blashley and like John McLaughlin Williams, who were our conductors in our first seasons, uh, and then reaching out to collaborators both on the artistic end and in um, the worlds of social justice, you know, it's really building that team that's most critical. Um, and then for that very first season, then as we were building the team, we were also building the program. And we thought that it was crucial that the program be reflective of the issues that we were trying to address, which is why it was in many ways a non-traditional classical music concert that featured mostly black composers. But I was very fortunate in that first year to be able to work with Ashley and wrangle her into the project that is The Dream Unfinished. And, um, <laughs> I would, why don't you talk about how you, how then you sort of grabbed me that one night. <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, so as I mentioned, we, um, I played in that very first concert. And um, as a harpist, I didn't play every piece, and so I was actually able to sit in the audience um, for a good number of, for a good portion of that program. And I was struck by a couple of things. First, just how impactful the programming itself was, how powerful the music um, seemed to flow together and, and to give um, and send a message beyond what I had, what I had expected. But also secondly, uh, how engaged the audience was and how diverse the audience was. This concert took place in July, which in New York City is typically it's a slower season for classical music, and seats were filled, and people were really paying attention to uh, the music and the words that were spoken. And I just said, you know, and if this happens again, let me know, because I'd love to be a part of it. And so over you know, the course of a few months, uh, we got to learn about each other, and um, I shared with her my research on Margaret Bonds, who's a black female composer, and as it turned out, uh, that was really kind of going to be the theme for the following season. That's how I got roped in. And we've just been so fortunate to work with Ashley because she's actually worn a number of hats with our organization. So she, as she's mentioned, she's uh, performed with us as an harpist. She's actually performed as a soloist on her instrument uh, in our 2017 season in the really stunning William Grant Still piece called Ananga. It just, which should be heard more often. That's why I'm telling you the name of the piece on the composer. <laughs> um, and but she, uh, her research in Margaret Bonds was actually critical in programming our Sing Her Name season, which took place in 2016, and focused on the marginalization of women of color frequently in this conversation of Black Lives Matter. So when I think about my own work and how my artistry is sort of pushing the boundaries in terms of um, engaging audiences around social justice issues, the first thing I think about is what's important to me and what resonates with me because, you know, artistry is about sort of the individual, right? And so for me to be authentic and to feel comfortable, I, I sort of look for uh, issues that I'm concerned about. And then from there, um, for me, the fun part is, is coming up with the program. And so music that's going to resonate with that idea. So for example, if I'm thinking about uh, trying to diversify um, people's listening experiences of classical music so that they're not just listening to Bach and Beethoven. So, you know, challenging them to think about where are the female composers. So if I'm doing a concert about that, I'm looking at excellent works by female composers. And in the course of that, I'm doing a lot of research because with my own projects that I do, chamber music or solo, I'm also creating a narrative to go along with the actual performance. And so I'm looking for bigger themes uh, to go that will make the music sort of resonate even more 
for the listeners. I'm really glad that Ashley brought up that point of excellence in music because I think that a lot of people within the, the industry of classical music still have it in their head that it's a choice between excellence or diversity and that you can actually very much have both. <laughs> and uh, so long as the work is being done and you know, as I had mentioned before, there isn't a tremendous amount of music by black or Latino composers that's available, but it most certainly exists. And there, within these different catalogs of composers, there are some really profoundly moving works. Um, you know, I bring up William Grant still. So full disclosure, I actually don't love the Afro-American Symphony, which is probably his most popularly performed work. Um, however, there are pieces in his catalog that I think are really extraordinary, like Inanga mm -hmm. and like um, Traceries, uh, which was um, that piece that we did with uh, solo flutes and string orchestra and harp and piano in our very first season. Um, and, and these are the kinds of works that need to be brought to the public's attention, um, not only because it's a composer of color, but because it's an excellent work that stands on its own merit and should be programmed by all sorts of ensembles and orchestras, you know, separate of any kind of cause. Mm -hmm. And you know, as far as this idea of audience engagement, um, I think something that the Dream Unfinished has tried to really focus on in um, its seasons and its own depth and growth is how to have more moments at which the audience is really asked to do something outside of the norms of a classical music performance. So as an example, in 2016, when we had um, Kimberly Crenshaw was one of the speakers for our performance, and she asked everyone to stand and she listed the names of victims of police brutality. The task of the activity was once you hear a name that you don't recognize, you're asked to take a seat. And when she began listing the names of women, that's when everyone in droves began sitting down. And you know, even just having that very simple exercise, but a very clear visual of what is known and what is talked about and who is talked about and who is valued, having that moment in our concert was really quite powerful. Um, more recently, in our concert that we just had, um, Sanctuary, there was this actually wonderful moment uh, for this piece written by a Chinese-American composer named Ro Huang. Um, it's called The Sonic Great Wall. And it's actually a piece for audience and chamber ensemble. So at one point, the audience members were asked to um, show words that they had brainstormed, which were um, evoking the issues around the border wall between Mexico and the US. And when the audience members would raise these words and the musicians were asked to improvise based off of the words that they were seeing. And so the fact that they had that moment where they were not only a part of the piece, quite literally in its um, composition and performance, but as I had heard from some audience members afterwards, people mentioned feeling seen. Uh, they mentioned the fact that the word that they created and then hearing how the musicians would respond and react to that, um, that's something that we're thinking about more and just trying to make sure that within every concert and every performance that we have that there are these moments where that wall between the audience and the performers is really sort of taken away so that there's this interpersonal moment that takes place. And what I loved about that particular moment at that concert, because I was in the audience with my mother and um, a, a colleague of mine, is that we had to work in teams, mm -hmm. you know, groups of two or three, and so we were discussing things. And so not only was there um, a greater sort of connection with the musicians, but also with the audience members um, who were seated next to you. And I thought that was really um, a unique but much needed sort of moment um, for a concert of this on this particular subject. Something that I sort of make a goal to do each year is to have something with my name on it. So it's usually a chamber music program. And so what I mean by that is that I'm choosing the program, I'm choosing musicians, I'm choosing the venue, and if I don't make any money off of it, that's fine. But you know, really about each season, I'm like, what am I going to say as an artist, I'm sort of free of other obligations? And so when I'm thinking about that particular program, um, 
the first thing I'm thinking about is sort of what's the theme? What am I thinking about? What's on my mind? What research do I want to do uh, this year? Uh, the second thing is um, who is my audience and how can my audience sort of be different than the types of audiences that I tend to play for. Um, I play a lot of contemporary music. Um, and so I'm, I'm also thinking about how can I sort of bridge, you know, sort of, you know, the grandmothers that I sort of grew up with, or the church people who came to my concerts as a kid, also with those in New York's classical music scene. And so in thinking about that, the programming then has to be of a particular nature. It has to be um, engaging, but also very accessible. Um, and so those are really kind of the big issues that I think about in terms of programming uh, for my own projects. For the Dream Unfinished, uh, basically the model that we follow from season to season is that we select a theme, a social justice theme. And then it's that theme that dictates all the artistic programming as well as the selection of all speakers that are involved. And, and also the panel discussions that may take place during chamber concerts leading up to our headline performance. And um, as far as how that, so, so that's the basic skeleton, but how that has been executed has been very different from season to season. So, you know, Sing Her Name, uh, which we had mentioned earlier, was a little more straightforward. Um, the event was centering black uh, cis and trans women, and so then it also centered black women composers. I think the Dream Unfinished is in a position to have this question more readily and more easily because of the fact that it's such a new organization and we're building from the ground up. I think it's a lot harder for organizations that have been around for a long time to have this question of diversity and um, you know, equity and inclusion because in many ways, it's already sort of a zero-sum game. You know, if there's a nonprofit that has a certain budget and it has a certain staff size, it's not as if you can just add 10 new jobs so that your staff can become more diverse. And it's not as if you can then push out 10 people from your organization to make the staff more diverse. Um, you know, we're really, in some ways, fortunate in that regard because since we can be building this with that intent, um, there isn't that question of making space. Uh, it's, it's, the space has already been laid out for us. And so that's why it's really critical that our team be as diverse as it is. It looks nothing like most nonprofit arts organizations uh, because it is, it, and it, it's really powerful because the, the administrative team and our board and our musicians, they are really much more reflective of what a city like New York looks like as far as our demographics. Um, and I think Ashley also spoke a little bit about how that is then um, reflected in the audiences that we attract. And so, you know, having those values and living those values and making sure not only is it a diversity of people, uh, but also a diversity of thought. I mean, we have people coming from all different vantages of the political spectrum. We have people with very different backgrounds. Some folks are really, uh, deep in the trenches of social justice work, whereas some folks are much more steeped in classical music. And so to have such different um, personal perspectives and philosophies coming in and having conversations and being brought to the same table every single time we're making decisions, um, I think that that aspect of it where we're trying to have um, more of a lateral approach in our decision making has been pretty critical as well. I've also espoused the value of not only having a diversity of people, but also a diversity of thought. And what I mean by that is the fact that within our team, uh, there are people coming from different points of the political spectrum, and there are also people with very different backgrounds. So we have some folks who are deep in the trenches of the work of social justice. There are some folks who are deep in the trenches of the work of classical music. And kind of everywhere in between. And so the fact that we bring all of these different expertises and interests and knowledge to the table every time we're making critical decisions, I think is uh, one of the ways in which the Dream Unfinished has been able to design programming as compelling and uh, unique as it has. So 
If there's anything that presenters or other artists could learn from a model like the Dream Unfinished, what I would suggest first and foremost is to just make sure that if there are any stakeholders that you identify, to uh, involve them in conversations early and to make sure that it's in a way that's genuine, where you know, you're not trying to work with this organization only for this one thing, um, for this one holiday, uh, you know, in a way that can feel quite tokenizing. Instead, to really reach out with an open hand and to acknowledge the fact that um, you're, you're asking to be invited into a space more often than not, and um, to really approach that with a sense of wanting to create a relationship and hopefully a long-term relationship so that this can be a collaboration that's revisited and built upon rather than just these one-offs. Um, I think that that is something that has been the organic way in which the Dream Unfinished grew from a very small uh, band of folks to now an organization that has approximately 10 volunteer staff members and a board of uh, 12 and continues to grow from season to season. So if, if there was anything that folks can package from what we've done, it would be to really have this open mind about cultivating um, collaborations and partnerships for the long term.